On today's episode, I speak to Jerry Flannery. Jerry played for Munster and went on to play international rugby for Ireland. On retirement from the game, he completed a Masters in Sports Performance and was persuaded by Des Ryan to undertake a short one-year stint as a strength and conditioning coach with the highly respected Arsenal Academy. He then turned his attention back to rugby, where he's now coached at his former club Munster and more recently became the defence and line-out coach at Harlequins, recently crowned Premiership champions. Jerry's journey from player to SNC coach and then to technical coach is made even more interesting by his experiences at an elite level football academy, his international career, and we dig into some of the cultural similarities and differences he's experienced throughout that journey in what was a really enjoyable conversation to record. Today's episode of the Informed Performance Podcast has been sponsored by Vald Performance, makers of the Nord Board. The Nord Board has become the gold standard for assessing field-based hamstring strength. By combining advanced sensors, real-time data visualizations, and cloud analytics, the Nord Board helps practitioners to accurately measure, monitor, and train individuals' hamstring strength or imbalances. To learn more about the Nord Board, visit our sponsor, volperformance.com. Okay, welcome to another edition of the Informed Performance Podcast. My name is Ben Ashworth, and it's a real pleasure today to have Jerry Flannery on the show. Welcome, mate. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Good to yeah, catch no up with problem. you again. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's literally a chance to catch up and we're going to record the conversation. It's been a few years since we were we last saw each other, right? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Wrapped up when I was leaving Arsenal and uh, and then to see where, what you've done for the last three years. Pretty mental, man. Some commitment to the, to the craft. So, uh, yeah, just for the uh, benefit of the listeners, can you just give a bit of your background and, uh, you know, like your career and uh, a brief summary of like your journey and, and where you are today, mate? Um, <clears throat> well, I was, I was a professional rugby player. I played, um, I'm from Limerick in Ireland and I played, I would have played with Munsters underage teams growing up and then I I, uh, I played at Munster schools and Irish schools and then but I was, I, I went up to Connacht to get game time initially for a couple of years, and then I came back down to Munster and uh, played at Munster, and then played with Ireland. Got, I ended up retiring then in two thousand and twelve, and studied for studied uh, sports performance, and then went over to ended up over in Arsenal with yourself. Uh, did that for a year. Uh, I was working in the academy as an S and C coach. Then I got. Um, I got uh, asked would I like to go back to Munster. I went back in as a specialist scrum coach and then did two years at scrum coach, then ended up uh, coaching the forwards and then coached the forwards for maybe maybe another three years there. And then I left Munster in, I think it was 2018. I think it was 2018 I left Munster and then came over to Quinns then in 2020, I think it was, or yeah, when I took basically took a year out and then went back to Quinns, and uh, I've been here since. Mate, it's a it, it's a it's a bit more than that. I mean, like you are a, you're an Irish rugby legend, mate. From uh, from everybody's perspective, and then obviously we bumped into each other when you were, you know, doing your S and C stuff at Arsenal, and then you've you've gone into coaching. Incidentally, uh, just uh, one of the one of the listeners of the show, Kelly Starrett um sends his regards and, oh yeah uh, kelly yeah he's a great guy i remember when he came over i was at the time when i was when i was in that when i was in that with arsenal when i was like in the snc industry i was like i was just obsessed with that guy and when he came over i couldn't believe it did you organize bringing him over that's right i organized it i, I just thought well i want to learn about him and i think we spoke about it i said yeah he's coming over he's going to do a workshop on one of his european trips and then we uh I think we all hit it off with him, you know, good guy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And he just had a, a real, for someone not someone who's not overly bright like me, I thought he had a real nice framework for, for how he, you know, how he, how he got across his philosophy, which, uh, you know, was real, real tangible. And, and you know, when, you're, you, when you apply it with players, they, they get it straight away as well because they feel the difference. So, I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot from my time in Arsenal. It was good. 
Well, he, he pointed out that he was at Quinn's first before you. He wanted me to say that. So uh, he, he'd been in a few years back, apparently. Yeah, I don't think he did much there, did he? <laughs> All right, well, mate, it's, uh, it's a real interesting journey and I kind of want to go into that a little bit. You know, you, you started and obviously started out playing international level rugby. So, you know, we haven't had many international players uh, on the show. Um, and then you, you did that brief spell as an S&C coach and then now you're back to, to coaching. You know, how has that, that transition been from player to strength coach back to sort of more technical coach? What, how's, how's that been for you? Um, it's, well, none of it was planned, you know, none of it was planned, but it, it has, I've taken, I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough that I've, I've, because I've worked across a few different areas, I've, I've been able to take things that, you know, and, and apply them in, 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 in different areas. Like I suppose the going from playing, you have a, you know, you go from playing and it's, it's something you're really comfortable with and, and you feel like you're competent, um, to suddenly you're coaching. And I suppose coaching is, is so less, you know, you, you got to spend time, time in, in the saddle really to, 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 to add, to be able to add value. And I think you're just, cause you have that mentality as a player that you want to, you want to be successful, you know, yesterday that I found it difficult initially because I felt like, Oh, I'm, you know, how, how good am I at this? You know? And I, but that's, you know, if, if I look back on it now, that's going to be the same for anyone, whether they, where they finish up a, a sporting career and they take up a new job, they're going to be starting from a lower level. Um, but I suppose the the actual the S and C work was probably easier to get into than than actual rugby coaching because the coaching there's, I suppose S and C stuff is is a lot more black and white. And I I found that I was able to get in like I went from playing playing with playing professional rugby retiring. I did a masters in sports performance. Um, I got qualif- qualified in as, as a SNC coach as well, and then um, Des Ryan, who was one of my old coaches when I was with Connacht, um, he contacted me because he'd been he'd been headhunted in by Arsenal. Obviously, you know this, but I, I let out headhunted by Arsenal to come in and head up their their long term athletic development pathway for young players. And I suppose he he was looking at people that would have understood the pathway because he was going to take a lot of things. That, that were using the Irish pathway, Irish rugby pathway, and applied them. So I didn't have a huge interest initially when he put it to me. Um, but I, I remember going across to Arsenal, just flew across to see the place. And when I went through it and I met Decky Lynch and, you know, I met Gary O'Driscoll was there as well. And, you know, there was a pretty good Irish, like, contingent uh, Irish group there. And, and I remember speaking to them and, and, and Decky just said to me, Decky Lynch just said it was a physio at the time. He just said, Jerry, he goes, if your life was a book, wouldn't this be an interesting chapter? And I thought, no, oh, okay. And um, my missus is from Guildford. So, you know, she was studying, she was doing a, a graphic design course in, in uni in Limerick at the time. So she was, she was like, oh, go do it, do it. So I said, I could commit to doing six months and uh, I got stuck into that and, and I ended up doing 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 the full season. Um, you know, wasn't always easy, but I, I learned an awful lot. But I suppose the thing is that even though I had no background in football, a lot of a lot of the the, the S and C kind of principles you can apply across. And Des was a very good guy for me as well as a as a mentor. And uh, I really enjoyed working with the players there. You know, I, I found that was the biggest thing that I learned was just you know, just being normal and being authentic with, 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 with people. And I think that footballers probably have their guard up a lot more than, than, than rugby players. Now I, I know that now after back of working as a coach in rugby, but footballers have a lot more distractions going on. They have a lot more people who are trying to use them. Um, so they're, they're a lot more guarded, but I learned an awful lot over there. When you, when you say that, it's interesting to look at that transition from the playing side um, and then you come in and you, you say it's more black and white as an S&C coach, but like you say, you've gone from rugby as a sport to football as a sport. You're bringing S&C experience of your own from, from rugby into football. So how was, you know, what, what did you think that you brought from the rugby side that helped those young men as they were developing in the football environment? Uh, well, uh... 
I probably understood a little bit of, of you know, because I'd gone through that pathway, albeit in a different sport, but I understood what Des Ryan was trying to, was the foundation he was trying to lay. And uh, and I knew that it was it was something that works. And I knew that if you just get the players to buy in, if you do enough to get them to buy in, they'll start to see the results themselves. And then it just becomes this this beautiful cycle then where they just start going, the harder I work in this, I can see the transfer. I can see it's it's a, it's a it's improving me as a player, making me a better athlete. You know, I'm staying on the field more and more robust. You know, the more time I can get on the pitch, the better I become as a player, the more valuable I, I become. And uh, I found those things were helpful. Um, and I suppose as well as that, like I, I wasn't long retired either. So not that I, at 33 or whatever age I was when I was doing it, not that I'm going to have, you know, chatting to an 18 year old kid who's come in from Brazil, not that I'm going to have a huge amount in common with him. But I understand that those kids are, you know, they have to make it work. You know, like they're a long way. They've they've committed a lot to do it. It's not like they live down the road and they're just having a having a cut at this thing. They're, you know, a lot of them have moved country. Their their entire families have moved. So they're, you know, there a lot of them are really really driven. And for the guys who aren't really driven, you want to instill that 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 drive in them because you can see you can stand back and it is such a conveyor belt football, and it's ruthless. There's always then there's another guy there that they're constantly looking to replace you. So. Some kids, some of the kids who may not have ever deliberately practiced to get better, they were just naturally, you know, they went out and they just played football with their mates. They were better. They were a good athlete. And then they get in a, they get in a program and they're suddenly they're going, well, oh, I'm here in Arsenal. Things are great. And I go, well, you know, you, you may have been better off. You may have been better off not like going to a smaller club where you'll break through. But, you know, I suppose they're rocking up into into london colony and they're seeing all these fancy cars they think that they're sorted and 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 you realize that if that kid doesn't work now he's you know he's 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 going to be out of the club pretty quick so you know there's certain things like that that i felt you know i felt like a duty or an obligation to try and help help the, help some of those players as well yeah and i think it was ov- obvious from you know des's uh sort of the framework that des put in place and the people he got in the characters he got in he got you and Johnny, who's been on the on the podcast as well, Johnny O'Connor, you know, and and Pordy Roach, um, you know, people who uh, I think brought a lot of experience and, as you say, like bought in, and that's the key thing to the pathway. Um, and then then you have to see results, right? You have to see for, for that to continue to be successful. You have to see results, but it was quite obvious that players were getting stronger, you know, individual athletes were getting stronger. There was quite a competitive element to the pathway, Um, but not just the sort of physical side of it and development there, but the sort of developing, you know, young gunners, I think, or whatever they was the, was the buzzword or the strap line. I think the cultural aspect that you touched on a little bit there is, is interesting. Like the rugby to football, these young teenagers, teenage millionaires, the pressures on them. Um, so then, then you went then from football and those challenges to like back into rugby, but you're still working with a lot of significantly talented, high profile young men in your current environment. Is there, is there something you took from football maybe that has helped with dealing with people like, you know, the Marcus Smiths of this world and the, the young talent that you've got there at Quinn's? Um, I, I suppose, look, it's, it probably gets um, when you go and reflect on anything like it. You you know, there's certain things in like just being authentic with people, being yourself, and being consistent in how you how you how you behave when you come to work. That's how and and showing. I think when it, you know those things are, are are key. Also, the fact that players have to have to genuinely believe that you can make them better. You have to show them that you can make them better because I can be consistent i can be a really nice guy but if i'm not going to make you better well well what's the point in having me around you know so i think you've got to show players you can do that as well um and i think if you if if you whatever sport you're in i think that um that if you if you, if you keep if you keep those things kind of front and center you, you'll do okay and i suppose from coming from say when i monster and irish rugby where you know, you have a not not a huge amount of diversity. You know, like rugby is a is a narrow enough pool. Even when you bring in a couple of South African lads, or you know, you bring in some Kiwis or Australians or any any players you bring in, it 
the, it's rugby still rugby you know people are generally quite the same whereas you know culturally football is so much more of a global sport that you know i found myself you know, like you know dealing with dealing with guys from different cultures that i would never have dealt with before and and having to figure that out on the fly you know and um it was really good for me and also the fact that if if i had gone and retired um from rugby and then gone back in straight away into say monster rugby or, or any other rugby club some of the kids there might might just go oh i remember him he was he was you know he was he played like you know he was he was an international player he you know you know think he was good and and you get afforded a little window of grace whereas i didn't get that whatsoever in football you know i wasn't afforded that so i had to prove to the players i could make them better straight away and then and then back that up by being consistently you know you know being consistent with my behavior and 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 being and you know just being myself and doing that for long enough that they go okay this is what this guy's expectations are for me if i come in and do those you know i'm going to be better and 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 we're going to get on well so that's probably where I was at. You know, football was good for me. It, it was I, I genuinely been at the start. I really felt like I was kind of drowning when I got in the job because it was my first job outside of professional rugby and you, you're desperate for it to work, you know, because that's if the first thing that you do after you stop having a career where you've been reasonably successful is a big failure, you know, that really knocks you internally. So I was, you know, my missus and myself had an idea of that we'd move over to London and, you know, she was with me while she, while she was on her summer break before she took back to uni, and that we'd really enjoy life. But I was just working all the time. I was working six days a week, and then when I'd come home, I was just studying. I was just studying all the time, just trying to keep my nose just in front, so that when I, you know, if Des asked me to run something next week, you know, and like even for me, when some of the, you know, you you start doing sessions with Serge Narby or or Oxide Chamberlain, and you know. Uh, Wilsh, any of those guys that that came, that rocked up, like I, I wanted to be, I wanted to to come across like someone who knew what they were on about, you know. And I didn't know everything, but I was trying to make sure that for that session, I knew enough that the player would go, "Yeah, I'm going to be better if I work with this guy." So I found that quite daunting initially. Yeah, and I mean, I remember doing a couple of one to one to one sessions with you with some of those players you mentioned there, and and there was no doubt that. You know, and then not blowing smoke up your, you know, over you, mate. But uh, essentially, the the ability to get buy in and that ability to show people and get people on board comes from like, you know, the values you show. I think, and you project on people the the, the preparedness that you came into sessions with. You know, those those kind of things. It, it was obvious that you were doing something behind the scenes to try and prepare yourself. Uh, to, Scram, to, uh, scrambling the night before yeah, is what I was yeah. doing. Scrambling, but I was, I, I probably, I probably knew where I was at. And, and the other side as well is that, like, if I'm really, really honest, I like, I really, I thought I was, I'm really, really grateful that Arsenal brought me in and gave me an opportunity to to experience a year in football. And I thought they showed a lot of foresight to see. Listen, we've got a, we've got, you know, if if this is an area where we can get a massive competitive advantage over our, you know, our competition. And football, when I came in, I was actually taken aback at how how behind it was in some areas in comparison to rugby. I was like, oh, shit, man, this is crazy. You know, like you bring the players in almost every single day, like the players play a game and then they all have to come in and do their recovery the next day in the pool for an hour instead of letting the guys sleep in and just trusting them. And I think that I took a lot, I, you know, that probably gave me a little bit of confidence as well. I said, oh, some of the some of the processes here aren't really you know they're not really at the top top level but you know des and push pushed them pushed them to to get to get them up to that but you know at the start the the bar was was reasonably low as well which probably aided me yeah i think that was a, a what i felt as well coming into coming into football from outside of football um you know coming from olympic sport into football i felt like there was a lot of low hanging fruit so um i i, I totally side with that that viewpoint um, you, you talked a bit a bit there about how you were kind of scrambling around. I mean, I, I did the same, by the way. <laughs> you know, you find an injury and then you're like, oh, God, I've got to deliver a pro- program tomorrow morning, so I better get my head in my books. And, uh, you know, that was just the sort of the level we were work- trying to work at, I think. But was there was there anything specific through that year that you you felt perhaps you developed 
either skill set or mindset that you've you've taken forward into into coaching the sort of technical aspects of rugby? Um, I suppose look, uh, a huge amount of S and C is around biomechanics, and um, if you can if you can teach people how to organize their body correctly into into collisions into into whatever it is they're trying to do if they're trying to express power and you can teach them to organize their body correctly well then a they're going to really maximize what they have they're going to really you're going to see just how good an athlete somebody really is if they if they know how to express that power that speed that strength um and they're also going to be like they're going to be able to do it for longer because you know they'll be more efficient in how they move they'll be able to be more robust because they're going to pick up less injuries because they're moving more efficiently. And they're, they're kind of broad things, but like you, you, when you learn about how the human body works then, and then, you know, it doesn't really change. Usually you go to rugby, then you're looking and you're saying, well, look at the way this guy's organizing himself going into contact here. Like he's, his back is rounded or if someone's not, 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 not splitting their feet low enough so that they, their hips are high when they're going into a tackle, you know, they're, they're never going to be able to be as effective as they want. And, my first job was as a scrum coach, which is effectively trying to organize people like you would do if they were squatting, you know, like trying to keep big chest and, and trying to coordinate all that, coordinate all that. Um, so like I was able to take those things across, but I probably like, I learned a lot from, from watching other people. I, I watched yourself and Decky working. I watched how, I watched how trust, how much trust um, was built between like between a coach and between the player and I, I, I saw how the play, how players became almost like um, they came drawn to certain personalities. So like some of the lads that 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 love working with you, they don't want to work with anyone else. Some of the lads that love work, work with Decky Lynch, they want to stay with him, you know. And then I would have, you know. So I saw that the trust is a really big part of it, really really big part. And I would have seen because football is is a pretty crazy sport. And when you when a couple of normal people are there, it stands out. You go like, oh, okay, Ben. Decky, uh, Des Ryan, like these guys are, are like Jordan, man. What a great guy, Jordan. He was just Jordan Reese, and then he was just an amazing guy, and and normal, you know. And people recognize that. And and when when things are pretty mental, you want to go to some sort of normality. You want consistency in behavior. So I realized that that you know, like that that is that is a big thing. And and seeing how Des Ryan, how he operated with players of differing. Uh, I suppose levels of maturity you know not just physical I'm talking mental maturity like some guys are you know some guys are 16 but they're acting like they're 12 some guys are 18 years of age but they're they're like a 22 year old they realize they see the bigger picture they go I've moved over from Spain I've moved my family across here my mum and dad have quit their jobs it, it's it's no good for me to be out you know drinking cans with lads in a park when there's a much much bigger game to be played here but understanding where those guys are because at the same stage like they're all young lads understanding where they are and giving you know individualizing your approach to them uh and i thought des was brilliant with that and you know a lot of times when we would be trying to get messages across to players who possibly weren't working hard enough des had a really really good manner I and mean, we'd walk we just walk a length of the field and we'd say listen we're going to talk for this length and you listen and then on the way back you're going to have your chance to talk and real simple things that give like a you know for a kid who who instantly is everything he wants to do is just is just you know sh- you know shout you down if you say something and you saying, listen when we walk this length of the field we're going to talk and when we finish then you're going to have the whole length of the field meant to, to to come back and tell us what you what your feelings are and what your thoughts are and they're simple things man but i found it brilliant you know i learned an awful lot because you don't get exposed to that like you don't get exposed to that when you're going through textbooks and when you're in courses you know like people will talk about it but like the practical application of it and having someone like des mentoring me through it i was like wow this is this is really good yeah mate um i think that's uh that's absolute gold that and, and i think it was quite you know it's ultimately hugely high stakes for the for the young for the young man coming in through the football environment and i you know i've worked worked a little bit in rugby academies but i found the, the the diversity within the football environment was a, a lot a lot broader um and also if i had to say it, the sort of cultural preparation for for working uh w- was you know like the the entitlement a little bit as you say the the, the car park full of you know a class mercedes or you know the, it's it's a different 
a different type of a different type of player that you're working with and you have to adapt but ultimately it comes back to being able to build a relationship and and as you say the trust aspect of that is key yeah yeah uh, listen i i i I was able to step back from it after a while and realize that like the kids that come into football are no different than the kids that come into rugby. It's just what gets thrown at them at different stages. And if you think of it, like when I think they sign for Arsenal when they're nine years of age, you sign a two year, two year deal at nine. And then at 11, you know, you know, 40, all you're doing at that stage when you're nine is just playing with your mates and it's organized. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, Arsenal are putting like a, a pathway in there, but it's still, nine-year-olds playing football having a bit of fun and then at, at 11 you know there's a call and a certain amount of those kids don't 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 get recontracted so by the time you get to 13 14 you may have experienced like two or three calls and survived them all and then people are just telling you you know you're, you're still only 13 14 and they're saying you know you're going to play for england now you know you're going to play for england and it's not like you're 13 and playing for england is when you're 26 you're, you're 13, playing for England could be in four years' time. So then you're going into school and, you know, with the best of intentions, a lot of kids are going to get their heads turned and they're probably not going to start paying attention in school because they know, well, in the next two, three years, I could be, I, I could be earning 10, 15 grand a week. And realistically, they can do. Worse, worse. And then, then they're, they're in the environment then when they're 16 and then they sign a big deal and 17 on, you know, they, they may earn more money than they'll ever earn again for the rest of their life. They may just start dropping off the face of the earth if they don't work hard. Whereas in rugby, if you're 13 and you're a good rugby player, well, no one's going to look at you for another six, seven, eight years anyway. And when they do look at you, it's rare that you're going to get anything like any kind of life-changing money. You're going to get in a program and you'll be rated. But the money in in, in rugby is, 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 is so much tighter than football that, you know, for someone to get compensated well, they have to be adding at the top line. They have to be performing for the first team. It's not that, you know, you're you're potentially going to be good, so we're going to put you on good money in the worry that somebody else will sign you. That that doesn't happen in rugby. So most of the time the and and also because of the the you know, the early specialization in football, because it's predominantly a skill based sport, uh, rugby being, you know, the physical maturation that you know, the physicality element, like if if you're the most talented kid in the world, but you're 17 and you're you're weak, you're going to get ripped apart when you go and play rugby. So you know they have to spend a certain amount of time, like have to spend a certain amount of time putting in hours in the gym and making sure that their mobility is right and you know just getting their nutrition right so that they can so that they can play the game. And uh, and that there's a certain amount of graft that has to go in there that that doesn't necessarily have to go in in football. I'm not saying it doesn't go in, but it doesn't necessarily have to go in and off the back of that, then a lot of kids like uh, what I would have been used is that any kids who go into academies in Ireland, generally at maybe eighteen, that they're they're on a four year, three or four year academy deal, and they're studying as well, so they're getting a little bit of the real world. And then if it doesn't work out for them and they're twenty one, twenty two, they have maybe a qualification that they can fall back on, but they've also got like they should have a reasonable a reasonable um, ability to go out and understand what hard work is. And just what a fort- how fortunate, most of them should know that it's a pretty fortunate position. Of course, I remember walking into the change room in Arsenal with guys that I, like players that I loved and listened to two of them saying, oh, listen, uh, would you play for Real Madrid and only sit on the bench and earn 80K a week or play for Villa and start for them on 40K a week? And I was like, I walked in, I said, am I listening? I- I- did I really hear you lads saying that? Because both of you are going to be over there in Tesco's packing shelves, man, in about in about a year's time if you don't get your fingers out, you know. And I meant it like I meant it in jest, but also like, geez, lads, that's so far away from where you are now. But that it's to them, it's not because they they rock in and everyone people don't talk about like, oh, he's he's doing okay, he's on five hundred quid a week. They don't talk about that. Like it, it, people are doing well when they're on two hundred grand a week, you know, which is insane. And it can be really, really blinding and, and distracting. I remember speaking to some of the players. I had a young lad and I was trying to get him to do, to do like some, uh, some intervals on a, on a watt bike or something. And, and he got in the bike. I said, I want you to end yourself here. Just give me, just give me maximum effort for like 15 seconds. And then you just cruise. And then just when I ask you to give it to me, give it to me. And he just looked at me. He pointed over to another player, a senior Arsenal player who was just 
going through the motions. And the boy can he goes, yeah, but look at him. He's not doing that. And I said, dude, you're trying to take his place. You're trying to take his place. And if you do what he's doing now, you will 100% be gone out of the sport. You, you don't get – I didn't come across that ever in rugby. Um, and that's a challenge. You know that, that doesn't mean that a kid's a bad kid. It's like he's just naturally looking around going, well, hang on a second. I'm looking at some guys who are doing very little, and they're where I want to be, so why should I have to do it? But it's just such a dog-eat-dog sport that you're, you're trying to get them prepared. I think uh, you, myself, and Decky – Lynch were probably responsible for ending a few people on a Watt bike uh, in the football environment. <laughs> yeah, I ended myself over there a few times. <laughs> Quite a few pukes on the on the Watt bike. There. <laughs> uh, it's a great tool. I've I've got one in got one in over here in Sparta, and we're trying to destroy some people and take them to dark places as well. So, you know, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, mate, so I just want to sort of you know, like we've gone through a lot of the background and, and, and it's really interesting around the kind of football and the differences between football and rugby, but like your current, I just want to kind of spend the last bit of the conversation talking about your current challenges. Like what, what things at the moment are you waking up now, you know, really challenging you and, and, and uh, driving you to kind of be better yourself as a coach? Um, I, I suppose when you, you, you spend a lot of time reflecting and, become trying to you know improve your own self-awareness and uh, i was reasonably self-aware coming over here but being self-aware and actually doing something about it are, are quite different so i came over and, and and the culture in harlequins is so different to what i was used to in munster like like munster is very uh structured it's put your head down work your ass off you know that's 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 that is how we're going to win things that's how we're going to do things and you know, no one, no one is, it's not about, in, you know, being an individual, it's about fitting in. And, and I know that that's evolving, you know, because that's sport, but that's what I was used to. And I really enjoy structure and I really enjoyed like just, you know, graft, graft. And when I came into Harlequins, it was so different. Harlequins is so relaxed. It was so relaxed. And my initial thing was like, oh my goodness, you know, it's no wonder they've not won anything in, in so long, you know, but the players are so talented, like, like incredibly talented. But I felt like, you know, I just looked at it with a monster lens on and thought, like, this is what we've got to make this club. And I was completely wrong because, you know, you can't you can't transplant a culture from one place to another. Each place has its own unique culture. And, and for me, I found it difficult to, you know, surrender, like, you know, to to sort of to accept about the different ways of doing things when they feel so alien to you and they feel so it feels so loose yet when you watch them play you compare the way the monster teams that i was involved in and you compare the way the harlequins teams played like they, they both they both translate like harlequins play loosely on the field and they play this fluid incredible brand of rugby and i think that you just have to you have to accept that well, that's that's the culture of this club people don't support people support monster because they're from monster or they can identify with this you know we're grafters you know and and it's it's an incredible club. Harlequins isn't a place. So most people love Harlequins because of the way that they play, because of the style that they play in, because of the you know, because of the individuals that play the game. And the guys that are, you know, Marcus Smith is an individual. Marcus Smith is an unbelievable grafter, so don't don't get any of that stuff twisted. But he's also a guy that you can't tell him, this is what you've got to do in this part of the field. This is what you can do in that part of the field. And just, just do those things really well. Because he's a brilliant talent. He is more talented than any player you'll ever come, I've ever come across. So you have to embrace that. And you, you, take your, you, know, you, you step back and don't get in their way because they're that good. you know. And that was, that was a, a big learning for me. And you know, something I, I, really, I was really grateful for that like I, I saw another side of how 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 you can coach of how cultures can be because you like anyone you become used to what what was successful for me in the past and then you want to stick with that all the time and sometimes that that can be a really flawed kind of mindset to have when you come into a place so seeing that and 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 the the way the harlequin story unfolded last year was a pretty amazing journey to be on and one of, one of the most pleasing things about it was that it was everyone. It was every single person in the club. They're not one person, you know. 
that idea, like I would have all been used to, there's, there's the head guy and that head guy is, is the guy who wins you the league and he tells everyone what to do and we all follow his lead. Worse, in Harlequins, it was more a case of, okay, well, the players are going to be doing this this way and they need us to support them there. And, you know, the head of player welfare, Andy Sanger, who's incredible, like, you know, he, he's making sure that, you know, all of the families and wives are good and making sure, listen, this player's under a bit of pressure here because of this personal reason. So let's give him a bit of breathing space there and, you know, getting around people and supporting them. And it's a really caring, really caring environment. And I'm sure now if I go back to Munster, that things will be, you know, will have, will have moved that way because sport is always evolving that way. And, um, but for me, it was like I was I was witnessing it like day in day out, and I was going, "Wow, this is this is pretty amazing." And and I would not have if I was the main guy, I would not have said this is the way we should do it. I would have been like, "No, we're not doing that," you know. But I saw it and I went, "Wow," and it opened my eyes to how little at times I I, I really know. And uh, brilliant learning learning curve for me. That's a really nice insight and. I remember watching the the final actually and uh, seeing you celebrate at the end of the smile on your face and having not seen you for a while and to see the smile on everybody's faces there and after a, a long period of without success. So obviously the culture is working, you know, and even this season, you know, you're still up there, right up there in the league and it, it's it's fantastic to see that, you know, we, we don't know the inside. We don't see what's going on the inside of a club. You know, you probably assume that there's a lot of these kind of frameworks and rigidity and those kind of things. But to hear that is is really refreshing. But it's working there for sure. Like, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, it's... Um, it's uh, oh, we, we get people like we had the FA. Uh, the FA sent a load of directors of football down, down to, to view it. And... I think it's it's different now because they they're viewing what we're doing as a, this is a successful winning environment because we won the league last year, but they could have come in at the same point last season, and they could have been like, "Why are they eating cookies? What? Why is there like cakes and cookies? There's like you know, it is a high sporting environment. Why is there like it looks like a it looks like a a twelve year old's birthday party here because there's cake and cookies there and there's coffee and um, you know and and then there's like, sorry, there's a fish and chip band there after training. And, you know, there's, you know, there's all of these little things going on, that, but, but they're all little things that all that are, that the, the club put a huge focus on feeding into the environment to make it fun because the way Harlequins play and the kind of players that they recruit, they're guys who don't like being put in a box. They don't like a strict nine to five. And you as a coach have to get, get, get out of their way and allow them to, to, to be the individuals that they are, which is not what I've been used to. But I see it now. I see that like, you know, some guys, like everyone has different motivations to play. And for some people, they're more like Danny Care, when Danny Care plays, like he loves, he loves being like in a big arena. He loves having 80,000 people there in front of him. He, he loves like He relishes that. Like he will always back himself. And you just need to get those guys in a position where that, that they're enjoying themselves every day when they come to work, which is, it sounds the exact it's completely contradicts what, what 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 we would have had in Munster where we enjoyed ourselves but we used to say like when I hear all the Harlequins that saying smiles on faces smiles on faces <laughs> we never smiled in Munster we smiled after we played but now I see it like it's just different players and 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 these guys are phenomenal players and uh and it's real it's real pleasure to come into work every day with them to be honest well that's great to hear look I'm um I could catch up with you all day, mate. It's St. Patrick's Day today. I hope you're going to, you know, uh, see the de- see the day in properly uh, later on. Um, I might have I might have one later on. <laughs> I might have one. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, the family there as well. So, look, I've been I'm really grateful for your time, Jerry. It's it's great to catch up with you. It's it's really exciting to see, you know, where Harlequins are and where you are. And, um, and and to hear all about that as well, mate. So, is is there a place that people can follow you? You on social media or? Uh, yeah, I'm on. I'm on. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm Jerry Flannery. Jerry with a J, and I'm on Twitter as well. I think it's Jerry. I think it's Jerry Flannery as well. It's pretty easy to find me. So, Jerry, thanks so much for your time, mate. Um, 
real pleasure to talk to you and uh, you know good luck with the rest of the season thank you Ben thank you my pleasure I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did um, some great insights and particularly some of the things around football and the differences that we both experienced between you know, Premier League Football Academy and and you know other sports Olympic sports and rugby well, we continued the chat after the conversation it's a shame we didn't keep recording because we spoke a little bit about Harlequin's cultural identity and it's been publicised that they've recently used Owen Eastwood, author of the book Belonging. And I would urge anybody who hasn't read the book Belonging to at least dip into it if you're interested in team culture and team identity.